Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the integrated uh, series of Nextilo, where today we will be discussing. Uh, there is an integrated uh, series with dermatology and microbiology. So the today's uh, topic of discussion is on sexually transmitted infection, and particularly we'll be concentrating on the genital ulcers. Because genital ulcer is one of the very, very important MCQ uh, question. Like you will get varied different um, combinations of questions from genital ulcer. You'll get questions from microbiology. You'll get questions from dermatology, from OG, from medicine. So anywhere genital ulcer is a very, very important topic. Uh, so I would also take this opportunity to thank Nextilo. The wonder has a name. I would like to thank uh, the director, Dr. Sunil Sharma, and the other co-founders for the opportunity. And I also request all of you to subscribe to the app, where the app has varied features, like you have different packages. So you can subscribe to the different packages and get the maximum benefit. And it is one of the uh, apps where you have the educators of their own branches. So you will get maximum benefit by subscribing to Nextilo. So uh, now we will move on to the topic. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jayanti ma'am, for the introduction you gave. Uh, so today we'll be uh, giving, we'll be talking about lecture on uh, the integrated series with dermatology and microbiology, uh, more focus on genital ulcers. So if you come to sexually transmitted in infections, uh, so in exams, uh, there are two important topics which needs to be covered. One is genital ulcer, the other one is genital discharge. The more important cause of genital ulcers include uh, syphilis, genital herpes, chancroid, lymphogranuloma venereum, and donovanosis. If you come to genital discharge, it could be urethral discharge or cervical discharge, uh, which are more commonly caused by gonorrhea and chlamydia. And uh, next is vaginal discharge, which could be caused by vaginal candidiasis or trichomoniasis. So today we'll be uh, not be discussing about genital discharge. We'll be discussing only about genital ulcers. So in genital ulcers, uh, we'll be discussing under these broad headings. So for each uh, ulcer, we'll be discussing about the organism, the transmission and incubation period, the clinical features, which includes ulcer and lymphadenopathy, and we'll be discussing how to diagnose and how to treat. Okay. So firstly, we will move into the uh, topic syphilis. Syphilis was one of the more uh, known sexually transmitted disease. And this disease has got this name syphilis uh, by one of the famous poems where it described about a shepherd boy who had this disease and his name was syphilis. That's how this disease has got the name syphilis. So what is the agent of transmission? What is the agent which is causing this sexually transmitted disease? In a whole, uh, the organism falls into the family of bacteria that is called as spirochetes. What are spirochetes? Spirochetes are thin, flexible, elongated, spirally coiled helical bacteria. Okay, so spira means coil and chite means hair. That is, it is as thin as hair. So that is why it has got the name spirochetes. So among the spirochetes, which bacteria is the cause for syphilis? It is Trypanema pallidum. So Trypanema pallidum is the bacteria which causes the uh, syphilis, it is mainly majorly through the sexual contact. So if I talk about trypanema pallidum as such, again, it is a slender, thread-like, motile, flexible, uncapsulated, spirally coiled with tapering ends. And then very, very important MCQ about spirochetes is they are motile bacteria, but usually we could see any bacteria which is motile. You can see their flagella because flagella are the organ of locomotion. But in case of syphilis, a very peculiar point, which is important is they have something called as an endoflagellum. What is endoflagellum is this particular bacteria, the flagella does not protrude outside the cell wall, but it is present in between the cell membrane and the cell wall. So the very, very important MCQ here is Spirochetes have which type of flagella? It is the endoflagella. It is a very important MCQ. So what is the movement it produces by endoflagella? They have a motility that is peculiarly described as a corkscrew motility, flexion extension motility, 
rotational motility with soft bending at the midpoint. So this is how we describe the motility of Treponema pallidum. So any of these words, if you find in the MCQ, then your answer is towards the Treponema pallidum, that is towards the spirochetes. So this is the picture you see here. Since this bacteria is very thin, their motility can be seen easily by using a dark ground microscopy. By using the routine uh, light microscopy, this bacteria would be very difficult to be seen. So the, the microscopy of choice for Treponema pallidum is the dark ground microscopy. So here you can see the background is dark and the bacilli is seen as bright object. And you can see they are very thin and they are spirally coiled. So this is the dark ground field of Treponema pallidum. So transmission is sexual contact or it can be through a direct contact as well. From mother to baby, it can cause congenital syphilis through transplacental route. And by means of blood transfusion, this disease can be transmitted. So these are the modes of transmission. And Treponema pallidum, the pallidum names come because the pallidum refers to the pale staining of the bacteria. Pale staining property of the bacteria, that is how it gives the name pallidum to the bacteria. So uh, if you look at the natural history of the patient with untreated syphilis, so first the patient gets infected with Treponema pallidum. So after infection, the organism gets inoculated and it multiplies. After multiplication, the uh, Treponema pallidum enters the circulation through the uh, endothelial cells. So after uh, incubation period of 90 to 90 days, uh, the uh, like organism causes a local reaction at the site of infection. That is, it forms an ulcer called chancre. Along with that, there would be uh, enlargement of the local lymph nodes. So this is called primary syphilis. So this chancre takes uh, three to eight weeks to resolve if untreated. And after the patient moves into secondary syphilis, whereas where in that stage, the because of the dissemination uh, through hematogenous route, it causes disseminated rash along with generalized lymphadenopathy. And this rash subsides in three months and the patient progresses to latent syphilis. In latent syphilis, the patient does not have any clinical manifestation, but only as serological evidence of the syphilis. In latent syphilis, the patient, 25% of the patient have recurrence of secondary syphilis within uh, one year. And latent syphilis could be early latent syphilis or late latent syphilis. And this cutoff is two years. Okay, so early latent syphilis is a patient uh, having a history of genital ulcers and uh, within two years of uh, within two years of exposure, within two years, and late latent syphilis is after two years of the expo uh, the genital ulcer. So two third of the patients with latent syphilis have no further complications, whereas one third of the patient with latent syphilis progress to tertiary syphilis after a period of uh, two to twenty years. So in tertiary syphilis, the patient can have mucocutaneous, mucocutaneous manifestations like gamma, or there could be involvement of the cardiovascular system, or that could be involvement of the neurological system. So uh, as we saw earlier, uh, the patient progresses through the stages. And for treatment purposes, it could be classified as early syphilis and late syphilis. In early syphilis, the patient is infectious and it includes the primary, secondary and early latent stages. In late syphilis, the, the patient is non-infectious and it includes the late latent stage as well as the tertiary stage. So tertiary stages could be having only mucocutaneous manifestations or cardiovascular manifestations or neurosyphilis manifestations. So we uh, talked earlier that the uh, syphilis has an incubation period of 9 to 90 days. So after an uh, incubation period of 9 to 90 days, the patient develops a papule which ruptures to form an ulcer. This ulcer is usually single. On a palpation, you see it is indurated. It's a painless ulcer. So syphilis contains the, uh, like if you pronounce syphilis, it has the last three words, lis, L-E-S. So it's similar to less. So syphilis and it's painless. Okay. So it's a painless ulcer. And if you see the morphology, it's round. It's like well-defined edges with raised margins. And it usually has a clear base with a dull red granulation tissue. And patient also develops 
lymphadenopathy after 7 to 10 days of the genital ulcer usually it's unilateral then it becomes bilateral and when you palpate the lymph nodes are small discrete and they are usually non tender and they have firm and rubbery consistency these lymph nodes because of syphilis do not suppurate that is they do not form an abscess in males the most common lymph nodes involved are inguinal group and in females the most common lymph nodes are femoral so now we'll move on to the laboratory diagnosis of syphilis so uh, like uh, the dermatology doctor has rightly mentioned there are different stages of syphilis since now we are talking about genital ulcer so the in the primary stage you have the genital ulcer so basically the diagnosis for syphilis is mainly dependent on the serology microscopy also plays a major role when the patient presents to you with the primary ulcer so in microscopy what we can do is so as i have already mentioned you that this particular organism is very thin and delicate and the motility has to be uh, demonstrated it has to be seen under a dark field microscopy so uh, what sample would you take you take the secretions from the ulcer directly and it is put on the slide and it can be seen under the dark field microscopy so if the sample is positive in a dark field microscopy what you will be able to see is a slender thread like motile flexible uncapsulated spirally coiled bacteria with tapering ends so that will be diagnostic of trypanema pallidum so as i already told you this particular organism has an endoflagellum so the movement is the motility is described as a corkscrew motility flexion extension rotational with soft bending at the midpoint right so uh, the sensitivity of the test is 80% with a detection limit of around 10 to the power of 4 bacilli per ml if the bacillary count is lesser the sensitivity also goes lower okay so the sensitivity of the test also depends upon the bacillary load in the primary ulcer so this picture here as i have already shown you this picture so this shows the uh, picture of a dark field microscopy where you can see the thin bright looking um, bacteria in the dark background so this uh, uh, particular picture in a dark field microscopy would be diagnostic of syphilis and also you can do a direct fluorescence staining for microscopy where you will be staining the trypanosomal antigen with the fluorescent dyes and if the sample has trypanosoma pallidum it will be never missed because it has a 100% sensitivity by direct fluorescence stain okay so this is the picture which shows the fluorescent stained um, spirochete the trypanosoma pallidum which is seen as in the uh, brighter and it is seen under a fluorescent microscope and also from the direct um, ulcer or even from the tissue section you can go for silver impregnation methods where you can use the levadity stain or the fontana stain so where the bacteria is seen as black color it is seen as brown or black in color so this is the silver impregnation stains so these are the microscopic methods which are used for the diagnosis of syphilis so next comes culture culture does not have much importance or much value in the diagnosis uh, but as such for to grow the uh, pathogenic trypanosoma pallidum there is no culture media available so that is why trypanosoma pallidum is one of the exceptions from the cox postulate because it does not have an artificial culture medium to grow but as such if you want to maintain the pathogenic trypanosoma pallidum the animal models in the rabbit test is the pathogenic trypanosoma can be maintained so non pathogenic strains of trypanosoma can be grown in a medium called as smith noguchi medium so serology which plays the main role in the diagnosis of syphilis that so is very important uh, your knowledge about the serology for syphilis is very very important if we talk about the serology of syphilis this the test are divided into two one is called as the non trypanosomal test it is also called as the non specific test or the standard test for syphilis so these are the non trypanosomal test why they are called as the non trypanosomal test because these tests do not detect the antibodies against trypanosoma pallidum instead these tests detects the antibodies against the tissue that is been broken down in the body because of the infection and these antibodies which are produced against the destroyed tissue and they are called as the reagent antibodies so basically the non trypanosomal test or the test which are usually used to detect the reagent antibodies 
and not against the triponemal antigen. So that is why they are called as the non-specific test or non-triponemal test or the standard test for syphilis. It's a very, very important MCQ. So they are uh, these tests are used to detect the reagent antibodies and the antigen used here is they are the non-specific cardiolipin antigens that are derived from the bovine heart. So basically the antigen that is used in this test is the cardiolipin antigen and the antibody detected are the reagent antibodies that are produced in the patients, right? So we'll see what are the non-triponemal tests that are in practice. So one is Wasserman test. The principle of this test is a complement fixation test. There is a CAN test, which is a tube flocculation test. Flocculation is nothing but a kind of precipitation reaction. What is precipitation? Where you use soluble antigen, it is called as a precipitation reaction. So CAN test is a tube flocculation. Now comes the most important test, which is used for the diagnosis of syphilis is venereal research, disease research laboratory test, that is VDRL. Okay, so that is also a slight flocculation test type of precipitation test. And you have a rapid plasma reagent test. So that is also a slight flocculation test. And there is an unheated serum reagent test. It is also a slight flocculation test. And tolidine red unheated serum test. It is also a slight flocculation test. These are the different non-specific or non-triponemal test or the standard test for syphilis that is done to detect the reagent antibodies in the patients, right? Fine. So now we'll talk about the specific triponemal test. So specific triponemal test, as I already told you, in non-specific, we are not detecting the antibodies against the triponemal antigen. Whereas in specific triponemal test, we are definitely detecting the antibodies that is specifically against the triponemal antigen. Okay. So what are the different uh, specific triponemal tests? One is triponema pallidum immobilization test here what they are doing is we are taking live triponema pallidum and the patient serum is added to the live triponema pallidum and if suppose the patient is positive and his blood has the antibodies against triponema pallidum the mobility motility of the uh, triponema pallidum will be inhibited and that will be seen under the microscope so this is triponema pallidum immobilization test is one of the serological tests where you use live triponema pallidum patient serum is added if the antibody is present the mobilization will be inhibited so TPI is one of the uh, gold standard methods that is used for the diagnosis of uh, syphilis. The next three tests where they use the killed triponema pallidum as the antigen. One is fluorescent triponemal antibody absorption test that is shortly called as FTA-ABS. Triponema pallidum agglutination test. Triponema pallidum immune adherence test. These are the tests where the killed triponema pallidum is used for the diagnosis. And then there are a set of tests where the antigenic extracts of triponema pallidum is used. So one is triponema pallidum hemagglutination, triponema pallidum particle agglutination test, one is western blot and enzyme amino assay. So these are the specific list of specific tests for uh, syphilis. So it's very, very important because in your exam, there can be an MCQ saying which of the following are the specific test of triponema, which of the following could be the non-specific risk of triponema pallidum. So you should know the list of non-specific non-triponemal tests. You should know the list of specific triponemal tests. And the other uh, modality for diagnosis is you can go for a molecular method to detect the genetic material of the uh, bacteria directly. That is polymerase chain reaction can be used. Okay. So now I will talk in detail about the VDRL test. VDRL test is a very, very important MCQ because one thing is it is a routinely used test in most of the laboratories as a screening for syphilis. And it is one of the non-expensive tests which is usually used in mass screenings for syphilis. Okay, So VDRL is Venereal Disease Research Laboratory Test. The name itself is very important. Okay, So I, as I already told you, it's a slight flocculation test. So it is one of the precipitation reactions where the soluble antigen is used. So the antigen preparation. So what are the things required for a VDRL test is one is you need the antigen. One is you need the patient sample that is the patient serum. And then for VDRL test, there is something called as a VDRL slide that is required. Okay, so we'll see them one by one. And what is the procedure for the testing? So at uh, the antigen preparation, I told you the cardiolipin antigen of the bovine heart is used for testing. And along with this, there is cholesterol and lecithin is added to the antigen. 
So the antigen is prepared. It comes in a powder form. It has to be prepared by adding with the buffer. It comes along with the antigen. And whenever, if it is reconstituted, the antigen has to be used within 24 hours. It is a very, very important question. When the antigen for VDRL is prepared, it has to be used within 24 hours of preparation. So patient serum, what is important with the patient serum is, the patient serum might have non-specific inhibitors, which can give a false negative result of VDRL. So it is very important that the patient serum has to be inactivated, preheated at 56 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes in a water bath. So it is very, very important that the pretreatment of patient serum is important. And then the VDRL slide. So here you can see there is this VDRL slide that you have 12 rings. They are the concave rings. So in this concave ring, you will add one patient serum sample along with that the inactivated serum sample along with that one drop of antigen would be added. After that, post adding of the serum and the antigen, it has to be rotated. This slide has to be rotated for four minutes and then after four minutes, the result has to be read under the microscope in the low power field. So in that, you will be looking for the uh, precipitation reaction. If you see there is no precipitation, the results are given as non-reactive. And if there are clumps which are formed because of precipitation, it will be given as reactive. And if there are uh, doubtful in between, then we give it as mildly reactive. So here in the picture, you can see this is no precipitation is there. It's given as non-reactive. And the in-between one, which is re weakly reactive but because the precipitation has not formed the flocules very well. And the last one is the reactive where the flocules are formed. So the result of VDRL is given as reactive, non-reactive or weakly reactive. So whenever it has come positive, you will go for the serial dilution of the serum sample, like 1 is to 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. And then the titer has to be uh, measure like the highest titer, highest dilution of the titer which comes positive will be taken as the uh, titer. So the VDRL is very important that you also have to do the titer of the patients who come positive because titer is very, very important before you start the treatment because it is usually a marker because when you effectively treat the patient by time, the titer has to fall down to four times. The four times titer has to fall by effective treatment. So VDRL is also one of the prognostic markers of treatment. So that is why VDRL is one of the most important tests that is usually discussed in the exams. Okay. And also uh, VDRL can be also used for measuring the antibodies in the CSF. So when you use a CSF sample, preheating of the CSF sample is not required, but preheating of serum sample is required prior to doing the VDRL testing. Okay. So what are the differences between VDRL and rapid plasma reagent test. Both are slight flocculation test. There are some differences. To start with, I would say that VDRL test results are seen under the microscope. A light microscope is required with a low power field, 10x. Whereas RPR test, the results can be seen macroscopically because the cardiolipin antigen will be coated with the carbon molecule. So the results are seen macroscopically. So you don't need a microscope to see the results. Next is, as I told you, the VDRL antigen, when it is prepared, it has to be used within 24 hours, whereas the RPR antigen can be stored up to six months at four to 10 degrees Celsius. And preheating of serum is required for doing VDRL testing, but for RPR testing, the serum preheating is not required. And with, through, by VDRL, you can test blood, plasma, serum, and CSF, but in the RPR uh, testing, CSF cannot be used for testing. Blood, serum, and plasma can be used. When are they, uh, in the VDRL testing, the slide rotation is done for four minutes, whereas in RPR test, the slide rotation is done for eight minutes. And VDRL, as I already told you, one particular antigen bottle, if you open it, can be tested for around 200, 200 samples. So usually VDRL testing is done for labs where you have a lot of sample load or for mass screening, for mass camps, you can use the VDRL testing. When it comes to like individual samples, or when the sample counts are less, you can always go for an RPR test. That is a plasma, rapid plasma reagent test. So what are the advantages of non-triponemal tests? So I have already told you non-triponemal tests will, uh, uh, will become negative or the titer will fall down with the effective treatment. So monitoring to the response of the treatment, usually the reagent antibodies become negative for six to 12 months after the treatment. So uh, whereas the triponemal test will remain positive lifelong, 
So triponemal test cannot be used as a prognostic marker. So that is why non-triponemal tests are used as a prognostic marker as a reagent antibodies levels will fall down with effective treatment. So very important MCQ monitoring the response of treatment and VDRL can be used in the CSF to detect the antibodies. The sensitivity of primary syphilis is around 90, 78 to 85%, secondary syphilis it is 100% and in latent it is around 95 to 98%. What are the disadvantages of non-triponemal tests? I have already told you it is a non-specific test. So one of the major disadvantage of the non-triponemal test is that it gives biological false positive results. So what are biological false positive results? By a non-triponemal test, the test will come positive. But when you do a triponemal test, it is going to give a negative result. Those cases will be considered as a biologically false positive results. So biological false positive is nothing but a condition where the patient might have other conditions in which it is gives a false positive reaction for um, the non-triponemal test. That is because the reagent antibodies are raised in the other conditions as well. That's why it gives a biological false positive reaction. The, bio the biological false positives can be acute or chronic. When the positivity remains for less than six months, it is called as acute biological false positive. When the positivity remains for more than six months, then it is called as a, a chronic biological false positive. So the acute biological false positive can come in any acute infection, any acute inflammation. It can give the uh, biological false positive. Chronic biological po false positives, where more than six months, it remains positive in conditions like mostly uh, by any collagen disorder, SLE, infectious mononucleosis in pregnancy, in HIV patients, or uh, it, in case of IV drug abuses, in uh, lepromatous leprosy, in all these conditions, a chronic biological false positive reactions are possible. So it is one of the disadvantages of the non-triponemal test. The next disadvantage is prozone phenomena. It is a very, very important MCQ. The prozone phenomena is a phenomenon where the patient antibody titers are so high that uh, it does not equalize with the amount of the antigen. So in that case, it can give falsely, uh, can give falsely negative. So prozone phenomena can happen. So it can be uh, like one of the disadvantages of non-triponemal test. And non-triponemal test is only a screening test and it is not a confirmatory test. Suppose the patient comes positive with a non-specific test, it has to be confirmed with a uh, triponemal test. If suppose the patient is, um, uh, positive with the triponemal test and if he is negative by a non-triponemal test, that means, uh, uh, sorry, if he is positive by a triponemal test and negative, if he is positive by a non-triponemal test and negative by a triponemal test, that means it is a biologically false positive. So it's only a screening test and it is not a confirmatory test. Okay, high yielding points. The test for monitoring treatment is DDRL. The first test to be positive is FDA-ABS. Rapid and mass screening, the test of choice is DDRL. Primary syphilis, the more sensitive test is Western blot followed by enzyme immunoassay. Secondary syphilis, the most sensitive, all the tests would be equally sensitive. The latent syphilis, the more, more sensitive test would be, all the triponemal tests would be the most sensitive in the case of latent syphilis. And in late syphilis, the most sensitive would be FDA-ABS followed by triponema pallidum hemagglutination. Overall, the most specific test is triponema pallidum hemagglutination and enzyme immunoassay. Okay, so now this completes the lab diagnosis. We'll move on to the treatment of syphilis. So according to CDC 2021 guidelines, if a patient is diagnosed with early syphilis, that is early syphilis, late uh, primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, or early latent syphilis, then the patient should be treated with injection benzathine penicillin 2.4 million units given intramuscularly. It is, it's a single injection and it's divided into two doses, like 1.2 should be injected into each buttock. It should be given after sensitivity testing. And if the patient is found allergic to penicillin, then the patient should be treated with doxycycline 100 milligram twice daily for 14 days. And after treating the patient, patient should be followed up clinically and serologically at six and 12 months. So what serological test we do? We do VDRL and we expect a fourfold decrease in VDRL titer within six months. 
and if the patient viral titer does not decrease by fourfold it indicates reinfection or patient has concomitant hiv infection or the treatment failure and if the patient is diagnosed with late syphilis that is late latent or tertiary syphilis then pin the patient should be treated with injection benzathione penicillin 2.4 million units intramuscularly given three doses at weekly intervals okay and if the patient is diagnosed with neurosyphilis then uh, because of poor penetration of the benzathione penicillin we give aqua aquas crystalline penicillin 3 to 4 million units iv that is intravenously every 4 hours for 10 to 14 days and regarding the management of the partner any partner who had sexual contact with the patient within 90 days preceding the diagnosis should be presumptively treated for early syphilis that is they should receive benzathione penicillin 2.4 million units intramuscularly uh, single dose if the patient uh, some patients after receiving penicillin might develop an hypersensitivity reaction called jarish excimer reaction so uh, this usually occurs within 24 hours after uh, getting penicillin injection and the patients usually experience flu like symptoms like fever headache malaise flushing and sweating and usually it lasts for about 24 hours and this reaction is due to the release of the treponemal constituents uh, and it does not represent true penicillin allergy usually it occurs in patients with secondary syphilis and if the patient has such uh, jarish eczema reaction then the patient should be treated with uh, nsaids and should be managed supportively now that we have completed uh, syphilis we'll move on to the next uh, 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 condition where causes genital ulcer is the genital herpes so genital herpes is caused by human uh, sorry herpes simplex virus so in herpes simplex virus there are two types Uh, herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2 so when we talk about genital ulcers the most common type causing genital ulcer is hsv2 more common compared to hsv1 so what is the mode of transmission transmission is through the uh, sexual contact so it can be genital anogenital urogenital and it is more from men to uh, women so it can also spread direct skin to skin contacts in case of healthcare workers so talk about the structure of hsv it is a capsulated or double stranded dna virus and it also has the glycoproteins on the surface primary genital herpes that is if the patient has genital herpes for the first time it is called primary episode and if the patient has recurrence it's called recurrent episodes so after the uh, primary episode the usually patient has an incubation period of 3 to 14 days so after 3 to 14 days after the exposure the patient develops multiple small grouped vesicles so these vesicles rupture and they form erosions which are painful and they have polycyclic margins and these ulcers are usually superficial and have uh, and have an erythematous base and uh, along with this ulcer the patient develop inguinal lymphadenopathy which occurs during the second or third week the lymph node enlargement is bilateral and if you palpate it is usually tender firm and non fluctuant and lymphadenopathy this lymph nodes do not separate sometimes the patient might have a local and constitutional prodromal symptoms the local prodromal symptoms could be itching pain and erythema which the patient might experience one or two days preceding the onset of the uh, erosions and constitutionally patient can have fever headache or myalgias during uh, the ulcers or little before preceding the uh, ulcer onset completing the clinical features the lab diagnosis of um, herpes Uh, it depends on the first thing is a uh, patient if he presents to you with the primary lesions right so we make a smear from the primary lesion and the smear is called as the zank smear it is a very important mcq uh, the question can be the patient presented and the zank smear was done and this is a finding if you see zank smear 
that means mostly it is pointing towards herpes right so zang smear the smear is named zang smear the staining which is done is usually a any of the romanovsky stain either jeans or right stain is done and then in the smear you will see the inclusion bodies are called as the lipschutz body and what you usually see here is multinucleated giant cell what is multinucleated giant cell is like two three nucleus have combined together that means uh, two three cells have combined together and the nucleus have started fusing right so these are called as the multinucleated giant cells so this picture here it shows that there are three four nucleus combined together and these cells are called as the multinucleated giant cell it is very typical for herpes so zang smear you will be able to see multinucleated giant cells and the inclusion bodies are called as lipschutz body right so one is the direct microscopy the other thing is the virus also can be grown in the cell lines when it is grown in the cell line the very pathognomonic feature of herpes is that it produces diffuse rounding and ballooning of the cells in the cell line so it is very very typical so you can see here there is rounding and ballooning of the cells in the cell line so this is uh, uh, this effect or this particular change which is brought about in the cell lines they are also called as cytopathogenic effects so this is the cytopathogenic effect of ballooning and rounding is very pathognomonic for herpes virus or you can go for a direct immunofluorescence from the sample and then it can be viewed under the fluorescent microscope for the detection of the vi viral antigen directly from the lesion so smear can be taken it can be stained uh, with the um, uh, fluorescent dye uh, which is tagged with the specific antibody of the antigen and then it can be seen under if there is antigen antibody combination if it combines there will be fluorescence that can be detected by the fluorescent microscope and then you can specifically go for and this antigen detection also can be specific for the type of hsv so a specific antigen detection either one uh, hsv1 or hsv2 also can be done again pcr for the uh, dna detection of the herpes simplex virus this also can be type specific either it is hsv1 or 2 you can specifically specific kits can be used to detect the type of the herpes simplex virus again antibody detection you can look for this specific type of antibody against the specific type of hsv virus and the antibody rays can be detected now we'll move on to the treatment of herpes according to cdc guidelines if the patient uh, the treatment of herpes depends on whether the patient has the primary episode or the recurrent episode so uh, since the first episode or the primary episode is more severe and it takes longer time to resolve that is 3 weeks to resolve they are usually treated for a longer duration for 7 to 10 days and the antiviral of choice include acyclovir 400 mg 3 times a day given orally or it alternatively patient can take valacyclovir 1 g orally twice a day or famcyclovir 250 mg uh, orally 3 times a day suppose that the patient has recurrent episodes the patient uh, can take uh, the antivirals uh, for 5 days and the dosage also varies for valacyclovir and famcyclovir for acyclovir it is 400 mg uh, orally 3 times a day for valacyclovir it is 1 g orally once a day and for famcyclovir it's 125 mg twice a day and you can see the treatment duration for uh, recurrent herpes is for 5 days whereas the first episode is for 7 to 10 days and if the patient has recurrences that is six or more recurrences in a year then the patient has to take the antivirals daily if the patient takes acyclovir he has to take 400 mg twice a day or if the patient uh, takes valacyclovir he has to take 1 g tablet one tablet daily and if he takes famcyclovir he has to take 250 mg twice a day and episodic therapy for uh, recurrent genital herpes the patient can start the treatment one day uh, prior to the onset that is when the patient experiences the prodromal symptoms the patient can start and it has to be started within one day of the established uh, lesions and regarding partner management the uh, partners who are symptomatic should be evaluated and treated and if the partners are asymptomatic the partner should undergo serological testing uh, that is type specific serological testing for hsv 
and they should be uh, managed uh, appropriately. Okay, now that we have completed syphilis, we'll move on to the next uh, topic, which causes genital ulcer, the chancroid. Chancroid is also called as a soft sore. Okay, depending on the clinical condition, it's also called as a soft sore. The cause, the organism causing this condition is hemophilus debris. Hemophilus debris is a gram-negative cocobacilli. They are usually found in the clumps or short chains of 15 to 20 bacilli together. So the appearance when it is done in the gram stain, it usually shows the appearance of school of fish or a railroad track appearance. It is a very, very important MCQ. Okay, school of fish or railroad track appearance is for chancroid, that is hemophilus debris. So these organisms, either it can be intracellular or extracellular, and it is a very fastidious organism. It is very difficult to grow. So usually it is grown in the medium containing blood or on chocolate agar. So it is a sexually transmitted disease. It is also called as a soft sore or a soft shank. Okay. Okay. Now we'll move on to the clinical features. Think. Uh, regarding chancroid, the incubation period uh, ranges from 1 to 14 days with an average of 7 days. And chancroid ulcers are uh, usually after 7 days, the patient develops a papule, inflammatory papule, which ruptures to form an ulcer. And 50% of the patients usually have multiple ulcers. The ulcers are painful and they are tender on touch. And these ulcers are non-indurated. And uh, that is why these uh, ulcers are called soft uh, chancre. Okay. The rest in syphilis, they were uh, called chancres because they were indurated. Whereas in chancroid, they are non indurated. That's why it's called soft chancre. And the characteristic or typical features of chancroid are the undermined edge and the dirty, uh, dirty floor. Okay. That is covered with uh, the slough. Okay. And these ulcers, they easily bleed. So if you compare with the syphilis, syphilis ulcers are single, whereas uh, chancroid or multiple ulcers, syphilis are painless and chancroid are painful. Syphilis are indurated ulcers and chancroid are non-indurated ulcers. Okay. And after uh, the ulcer, the patient also develop lymphadenopathy. It's unilateral in most of the patients and sometimes some patients can have bilateral uh, lymph node involvement. They are painful and they are tender and 25% of the patients with the lymph nodes, the lymph node can separate to form an abscess. Okay, And this abscess may rupture to uh, form a, a sinus resembling a chancred ulcer. And you can uh, notice that this usually the patient has a single sinus. Okay, so it's a painful lymph node and they separate. Okay. Now moving on to the laboratory diagnosis of chancroid. So basically it is from the primary lesion. Uh, from the primary lesion, we can make a smear and a gram stain will show gram negative cocobacilli, which has an appearance of school of fish or the railroad track appearance. So this figure here, you can see the bacilli are arranged in chains, right? So it has a Railroad tract or fish in stream appearance is very typical. It's very, very important MCQ question. If you see the word of school of fish or railroad tract appearance, it is hemophilus degree, then the condition caused by degree is chancroid. Right? And the culture medium, you can grow it on the rabbit blood agar or the chocolate agar. And in embryonated eggs, in the embryonated egg, you can grow the bacteria in the chorioallantoic membrane. Right? So the, now moving on to the treatment. Uh, if we uh, find the patient to have chancroid, then the patient has to be treated with azithromycin 1 gram orally single dose. Alternatively, the uh, patients can receive ceftriaxone 250 milligram intramuscular injection or ciprofloxacin 500 milligram twice daily dose for 3 days or erythromycin 500 milligram 3 times a day for 7 days. And regarding partner management, all the partners whether either symptomatic or asymptomatic, who had sexual contact with the patient in the preceding 10 days have to be treated with uh, azithromycin or the alternate medicines. 
so before moving on to the next topic i would remind um, all the viewers to kindly subscribe to the nextilo app and to get the maximum benefit so the next uh, topic of discussion is lymphogranuloma venerum so lymphogranuloma venerum is caused by chlamydia trochomatis if we talk about chlamydia trochomatis chlamydia trochomatis have uh, bio wars and among the bio wars you have different serotypes so one of the bio war that is causing lymphogranuloma venerum the bio war is named as lymphogranuloma venerum and the serotype causing chlamydia trochomat sorry causing lgv is l1 l2 and l3 the serotype l2 is more common compared to l1 and l3 very very important points about chlamydia trochomatis that is lgv is they are obligate intracellular gram negative bacteria they cannot grow on artificial uh, culture medium so they are usually grown on mice or on embryonated egg or in the cell lines they are filterable similar to that of the viruses and they also have inclusion body but how do they differ from virus is they have both the rna and dna but viruses will either have one of the nucleic acids either rna or dna but chlamydia has both right and uh, when we talk about the chlamydia they cannot produce their own atp uh, for their energy um, needs so it is dependent on the host for the atp production and uh, all these chlamydia they have tropism for squamous epithelial cells and for the lymph nodes and when they multiply inside the host they have two forms they exist in two forms one is called as the elementary bodies and the others are called as the reticulate bodies so where uh, if i talk about the elementary bodies or the inactive form the reticulate bodies or the replicating bodies the elementary bodies are the um, uh, um, so uh, the elementary bodies are the intracellular form and the reticulate bodies are the extracellular form so the various differences between the elementary bodies and the reticulate bodies so we'll move on to the clinical features so uh, lymphogranuloma venereum has an incubation period of 7 to 12 days and it can be as long as 6 months and the clinical features of lgv are divided into three stages primary stage is an asymptomatic genital ulcer secondary stage is lymphadenopathy that is inguinal syndrome and the tertiary stage is the complication that is genito anorectal syndrome in primary stage the the classical lesion is a painless uh, papule vesicle on erosion and which is very small and usually transient the patient even might not notice it okay and the ulcer is usually single they are round or oval and the ulcer can be superficial or deep and they usually heal without a scar within 3 uh, days okay and secondary stage is the enlargement of the lymphadenopathy and this occurs after 2 to 6 weeks of the primary stage and the lymph node is unilateral uh, involvement and they are painful and they are tender on palpation these lymph nodes they form abscess and which rupture uh, to form multiple sinuses in chancroid we saw if the uh, axis of the lymph nodes uh, separate that is if the bubo separates it's usually single sinus whereas in lgv it is multiple sinuses sometimes in patients with lgv might also develop uh, enlargement of the femoral group of lymph nodes okay so there will be involvement of inguinal group as well as femoral group and this is divided or uh, separated by an inguinal ligament and this appears clinically as a groove and it's called groove sign of green blot and uh, after secondary stage patient if not treated can progress to tertiary stage okay and this is mostly seen in women and in homosexual men it is uh, called genito anorectal syndrome because the genitalia anorect ano anus and rectum can be involved and there could be obstruction of the lymphatics called uh, causing uh, like elephantiasis of the vulva which is which is called esthiomene or there could be rectal abscess fistula or the rectal stricture and there could be inflammation of the rectum it's called proctitis okay 
moving on to the laboratory diagnosis of uh, LGV. So basically, these patients, if we talk about, um, uh, they might have sterile pyuria, like say that uh, they might have neutrophils in the urine, but uh, there will be no organism that will be found because they are poorly gram stain. They don't take up the gram stain. So the other stains which are usually used is Machiavello, Castaneda, Ginza stain, and the inclusion bodies will be detected in the cytoplasm. So the inclusion bodies of lymphogranuloma venerum is called as Miyagawa corpuscles. And uh, for, uh, for chlamydia trochomatis, the inclusion bodies are usually formed among the glycogen matrix. So when the glycogen matrix is there in the inclusion bodies, the glycogen will take up iodine and it will be stained black. So oligols iodine can be used to detect the inclusion bodies of chlamydia trochomatis. So this is about the microscopy. Culture, it can be cultured in the mice. In Yorkshire inoculation, chlamydia can be grown. Or the cell lines, usually the McCoy cell lines are used. And direct immunofluorescence can be used to detect the direct uh, detection of inclusion bodies. And in serology, the most important thing which you have to remember, whenever we talk about the chlamydial group of organism, there are three type of antigens you have to remember. One is a group-specific antigen, right? Then one is the um, species-specific antigen. The other is the serotype specific antigen. Okay, so enzyme immunoassay can be used to detect the group specific antigen. Complement fixation test can be used for the genus specific, that is, lipopolysaccharides can be detected. And when you talk about the serotype, usually it is the outer membrane protein, which is the serotype specific uh, that can be detected by use of using an immunofluorescence test. And then molecular method, the polymerase chain reaction, which can detect the uh, bacterial antigen the bacterial genome uh, from the uh, patient sample. So that is the gold standard test for chlamydial diagnosis. Moving on to the treatment. If the patient uh, is found to have uh, LG, uh, LGV, the patient needs to be treated with do uh, doxycycline capsules, 100 milligram twice daily for three weeks. And alternatively, patient can also receive erythromycin uh, base 500 milligram four times daily for three weeks. Regarding partner management, all partners, whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic, who had sexual contact with the patient the preceding 60 days should be treated. And it, they should be treated with doxycycline 100 milligram twice daily for seven days, or they can take azithromycin one gram single dose. And the fluctuant lymph nodes should be aspirated using a white bone needle from the non-dependent part and it should be drained. So next we'll move on to donovanosis. Okay. So if we talk about donovanosis, the causative organism causing the condition is Klebsiella granulomatis. Previously, this organism was also called as Kelimetobacterium granulomatis. Okay, so Klebsiella granulomatis is a gram negative bacilli. It is an intracellular bacterium. It is a capsulated bacteria, right? We will move on to the uh, clinical features. The incubation period of donovanosis ranges from three days to three months with an average of 17 days. In donovanosis, there will be, a, uh, there'll be multi single or multiple firm papules which rupture to form um, ulcers. And they could be singular multiple ulcers, and these ulcers are painless. They have well defined margins and elevated edges. And when you look at it, it looks beefy red. Okay, it is more red. And they bleed easily on touching or manipulation. And in donovanosis, lymph nodes are not usually involved. Okay. And sometimes there could be involvement of the subcutaneous nodule and which can appear as a lymph node. And this is called pseudobubo. So moving on to the lab diagnosis. In laboratory diagnosis, uh, we can uh, take the direct smear from the lesion. And from the lesion, if you do a uh, smear and then stain with the Ginza stain, you will be able to see capsulated bipolar staining. Usually bacteria which has bipolar staining will have a safety pin appearance, right? So in a Gimsa stain, you will be able to see the donovan bodies are nothing but the bacteria, which has a safety pin appearance. So usually you can see this picture where you have the 
macrophage and then you can see the capsulated bacteria around it. So this is a very typical picture of uh, donovanosis when you take the smear from the direct lesion. Now moving on to the treatment. Regarding treatment of donovanosis, uh, the patient is diagnosed with donovanosis, then they should be treated with azithromycin one gram weekly for three weeks, or they can take 500 milligram daily for three weeks or until the complete healing of the lesions. Alternatively, patient can be treated with the doxycycline 100 milligram twice daily or ciprofloxacin 750 milligram twice daily or erythromycin 500 milligram four times daily or uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole uh, that is septran uh, twice daily. And they should be continued for three weeks or till the complete healing of the lesions. And regarding partner management, the patient, uh, the partners who had sexual contact with the patient the preceding 60 days should be treated. To summarize, uh, the ulcer, the characteristics of the ulcer, syphilis, LGV, and donovanosis uh, can have single ulcers. Whereas in herpes and chancroid, they are usually multiple ulcers. And donovanosis sometimes can also be, uh, can have multiple ulcers. Regarding the pain, herpes and chancroid are painful. Okay. And regarding the edges or the margins, uh, herpes has a polycyclic margins and chancroid has an undermined edge. And regarding the base, herpes has an erythematous base and chancroid, whereas chancroid has a purulent, dirty gray base. Okay. And this is very typical of chancroid and it e bleeds easily. Similarly, in donovanosis, the base is beefy red and they also bleed easily. Regarding induration, the ulcer of syphilis is indurated. That is why it's called art chancre, whereas in chancroid, that's not indurated and it's called soft chancre. Okay, these are the typical points and these are some clues you can look at the questions during your exams. And summarizing the characters of the lymph node, uh, regarding the involvement, it's in syphilis and herpes, it's usually bilateral involvement, whereas in chancroid and LGV, it is unilateral involvement. Regarding the pain, herpes and chancroid, it's painful lymphadenopathy, whereas in syphilis and LGV, uh, pain is less or absent. And the lymph nodes of chancroid and LGV, they separate to form abscess and which rupture to form sinus. Usually in chancroid, it's, uh, it is a single sinus, whereas in LGV, it has multiple sinus. And if you look at donovanosis, it does no uh, involvement. That is dono, donovanosis. So it, the name contains no. So the patient also does not have no uh, lymph nodes. And if a patient comes to a tertiary uh, healthcare center, the patient can be worked up uh, like with the investigations and can be treated based on the investigation reports like sculpture and serology. Whereas in the patient goes to a primary health center where there are no, uh, uh, there are no, pro uh, uh, there are no settings for culture or serology. The patient has to be empirically treated or presumptively treated. This is called syndromic management. Okay. The, suppose the patient goes with a primary healthcare center with a genital ulcer, they would be syndromically managed. So first the uh, physician will classify whether the ulcer, genital ulcer is herpetic or non-herpetic. Non so in herpetic ulcer, they usually uh, ulcers have polycyclic margins and they usually have recurrences and they are painful. Okay, suppose if the patient is found to have herpetic genital ulcer, then the patient would be given a red kit or the kit 5. Okay, this contains tablet acyclovir 400 milligram three times daily for seven days. Okay, whereas if the patient has a, a genital ulcer, which is found to be non-herpetic. So what all ulcers which are non-herpetic, it could be because of syphilis or it could be because of chancroid or it could be because of donovanosis or it could be because of lymphogranuloma venereum. But based on epidemiology, the donovanosis and lymphogranuloma venereum are not usually uh, seen. 
and if lymphogranulinum is present it should be present as uh, bubos okay which has a separate kit so in this patients are usually treated for syphilis and chancroid for syphilis the patient would be treated with injection benzathione penicillin and for chancroid patient would be given azithromycin single dose so this is contained in white kit okay so usually penicillin are given after sensitivity testing this was discussed earlier so of course if the patient is found to be allergic to penicillin then the patients are given doxycycline 100 mg twice daily for 15 days okay along with the treatment for chancroid that is azithromycin 1 g stat dose so this is contained in blue kit or the kit 4 okay so there are three kits kit 3 that is white kit for uh non herpetic genital ulcers and the patients who are not sensitive to penicillin and the next kit is kit 4 or the blue kit which is given to patients who are having non herpetic genital ulcers and the patients having are uh, uh, sensitivity to penicillin or allergic to penicillin okay and the next kit is kit 5 or red kit which includes acyclovir uh, tablets and it's usually given for herpetic ulcers and regarding partner management if the patient is found to have non herpetic ulcer the all the sexual partners are treated either with kit 3 or kit 4 depending on the sensitivity to penicillin whereas in case of herpetic genital ulcers partner management is not included in the syndromic management okay and this kit so these kits are developed by naco okay this is mostly useful in the setting where uh, the investigations are not available next we'll move on to the questions thank you doctor so now uh, we'll move on to the question and answer session so question number 1 uh, so there is a 25 year old male had unprotected sexual intercourse with a commercial sex worker and he developed painless incurated ulcer on the penis 3 weeks later so the inguinal lymph nodes are enlarged on both the sides which among the following diagnostic methods would you prefer so as discussed earlier uh, so the clues for this ulcer are painless and their indurated ulcer okay and this is as an incubation period of 3 weeks and along with that they have given another clue that is involvement of the inguinal lymph nodes and its bilateral okay so it's a painless indurated ulcer the painless ulcers could be syphilis or it could be lgv or uh, uh, donovanosis but it's indurated and induration is commonly seen in syphilis and it the syphilis also has uh, lymph node enlargement on both sides okay so the clinical scenario is typical of syphilis so or syphilitic ulcer okay being said that the clinical features are matching to syphilis so now you see the options so option a says it is a polymerase chain reaction for hsv2 is it required it is not at all required because it is syphilis sorry herpes is not even falling into the differentials so a is ruled out okay then gram strain of the ulcer discharge like syphilis is caused by trypanema pallidum so trypanema pallidum i already told you it is very difficult to see trypanema pallidum under the direct microscopy so gram stain is not the choice of microscopy for trypanema pallidum right and then if you see the so option b is ruled out if you see the option d it says gems are stain from the bubo aspirate so again gems are stain is also not done for trypanema pallidum so this is also ruled out so the answer here is option c which says the dark field microscopy of the ulcer discharge yes so the answer is dark field microscopy of the ulcer discharge okay so we'll move on to the next question so the next question is which of the following are true about chancroid a gram stain from the lesion uh, which shows school of fish appearance option b is bleed thing on touching option c is painful and option d is bruising okay so among these options uh, we know that in chancroid it is painful okay and it it bleeds easily on touching 
and if you do gram stain it will show school of fish appearance whereas option d gru sign it's usually seen in lymphogranuloma venereum we saw that there be involvement of inguinal and femoral group of lymph nodes in uh, uh, the secondary stage and it usually separate, uh, separated by the inguinal ligament which clinical manifest clinically manifests as gru sign okay so gru sign is seen in lgv so first three options are typical of chancroid so that will be option 2 that is a b and c only and regarding next question so which of the following presents with painful genital ulcers option a hemophilus ducri option b neisseria gonorrhea option c chlamydia trachomatis and option d herpes simplex virus so hemophilus ducri causes chancroid we know that chancroid is a painful genital ulcer so option a is correct neisseria gonorrhea so it doesn't usually not does not cause ulcers genital ulcer it usually causes a uh, genital discharge so option b is ruled out option c chlamydia trachomatis uh, it could cause genital ulcer uh, which is painless uh, it's called lymphogranuloma venereum it's and the uh, ulcer is painless and transient sometimes it can also cause genital discharge so option c as causes chlamydia trachomatis causes painless genital ulcer in option d herpes simplex virus we know genital herpes is a uh, painful ulcer so in this option a and option d are causes of painful genital ulcer so fourth option a and d only so next question is a college student came with painful group vesicles over genitalia uh, what will be the next investigation you would want to perform and what will be the finding so he has come with painful group vesicles so these all are typical of herpes genital herpes so it's painful and they are grouped vesicles okay so it's typical of herpes being said that this particular clinical feature is matching towards uh, herpes so here looking at the option option b says gram stain showing school of fish appearance we know gram stain showing a school of fish appearance is for hemophilus ducri so that causes chancroid so option b is ruled out so dark field microscopy as we have discussed showing a slender motile organism is very typical of trypanema pallidum that is for syphilis so that is also ruled out a gene plus stain showing safety pin appearance that is a very typical presentation of donovanosis for klebsiella granulomatis so that is also ruled out so here the option a is uh, sh- saying that zanc smear showing zanc cells that is nothing but the multinucleated giant cell so very typical finding for herpes simplex virus so the option here is option a that is zanc smear showing the zanc cells so moving to the next question so next question is a The 34-year-old laborer, three years back, presented with penile ulcer, and he was not treated. Later, he presented with neurological symptoms uh, for which he got treated. So, what is the test of choice to monitor response to treatment? So, in this question, the patient had a penile ulcer uh, three years back, which was not treated. Okay. and the patient has seen and progressed to have uh, neurological symptoms so patient is having genital ulcer and has progressed to the neurological symptoms and the clue here is not treated okay the patient of syphilis which is having a uh, which is not treated then the patient might progress to tertiary syphilis with neurological symptoms so and uh, this is classical of neurosyphilis okay this clinical scenario is typical of neurosyphilis so moving on to the like uh, like doctor has said that it is a neurological syphilis so we have the clinical diagnosis the question here is the test of choice to man uh, to monitor the response to treatment say suppose the question is the test of choice for diagnosis then as i have already told you in the case of late syphilis the most appropriate test would be to do the trypanemal test right suppose if the test of choice for diagnosis then i would go for fta abs right that is fluorescent trypanemal antibody absorption test but here if you carefully see the option says 
the test of choice to monitor the treatment. So it's very important. Everybody should know that all the triponemal tests will remain positive for lifelong, right? So you cannot monitor the treatment by doing a triponemal test. Triponemal test is only to confirm the diagnosis. But if you want to monitor the response prognosis of the treatment, then the non-triponemal test, mostly VDRL is the test of choice to monitor the treatment response. Because VDRL test, you will also look for the titer in the initial diagnosis. But after starting the treatment, effective treatment is given. Usually, the reacting antibody levels falls down, and there will be a four-fold decrease in the titer by doing VDRL. So VDRL here is the answer. So VDRL is a drug of choice to monitor the treatment response. Suppose in this question, if VDRL was not there, right, and RPR was there, RPR is also one of the non-specific tests for syphilis. So suppose VDRL was not there and RPR is there, then we will go for RPR. Since VDRL is there, VDRL is the test of choice for the monitoring of treatment for syphilis. So the answer here is the VDRL, that is Venereal Disease Research Laboratory test, right? So now that we have completed the whole sexually transmitted disease that is uh, presenting with um, genital ulcers, so we have discussed very topics and these topics are very, very, very high yielding and very important for your exams and also for your day-to-day -day practice. So I also uh, thank uh, uh, the next Nextilo coordinators, the director and also the co-founders. And I also request all of you to again, uh, like subscribe to the app and get the different packages available. And I, I again, I will repeat that all the faculties or all the educators in this platform or of their own branches. So you will be getting the maximum benefit and for more interesting videos similar to this, you will be able to get it when you subscribe the app. So thank you so much. Over to Dr. Dermatology. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank uh, the director and the co-founders of Nextilo. I hope the integrated class on this genital ulcer was helpful. Please subscribe to Nextilo. Uh, soon we'll be coming up with more such integrated classes, which would be very helpful in uh, answering the questions which are asked in recent uh, exams. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much.